Hello and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jay and this is a web of classic tales. If you're enjoying the videos, please like, subscribe, and share. If you want notifications every single time a new video is uploaded, please click on the little bell icon. Today we will continue reading Edgar Allan Poe's The Pit and the Pendulum. Upon waking and stretching forth an arm, I found beside me a loaf and a pitcher with water. I was too much exhausted to reflect upon this circumstance, but ate and drank with avidity. Shortly afterward, I resumed my tour around the prison, and with much toil came at last upon the fragment of the surge. Up to the period when I fell, I had encountered fifty-two paces, and upon resuming my walk, I had counted forty-eight more. When I arrived at the rag, there were, in all, then, a hundred paces, and admitting two paces to the yard, I presumed the dungeon to be fifty yards in the circuit. I had met, however, with many angles in the wall, and thus I could form no guess of the shape of the vault, for vault I could not help supposing it to be. I had little object, certainly no hope these researches, but a vague curiosity prompted me to continue them. Quitting the wall, I resolved to cross the area of the enclosure. At first I proceeded with extreme caution, for the floor, although seemingly of solid material, was treacherous with slime. At length, however, I took courage, and did not hesitate to step firmly, endeavouring to cross in as direct a line as possible. I had advanced some ten or twelve paces in this manner, when the remnant of the torn hem of my robe became entangled between my legs. I stepped on it, and fell violently on my face. In the confusion attending my fall, I did not immediately apprehend a somewhat startling circumstance, which yet, in a few seconds afterward, and while I still lay prostrate, arrested my attention. It was this. My chin rested upon the floor of the prison, but my lips and the upper portion of my head, although seemingly at a less elevation than my chin, touched nothing. At the same time, my forehead seemed bathed in a clammy vapor, and the peculiar smell of decayed fungus arose to my nostrils. I put forward my arm and shuddered to find that I had fallen at the very brink of a circular pit, whose extent, of course, I had no means of ascertaining at the moment. Groping about the masonry just below the margin, I succeeded in dislodging a small fragment and let it fall into the abyss. For many seconds I hearkened to its reverberations as it dashed against the sides of the chasm in its descent. At length there was a sullen plunge into water, succeeded by loud echoes. At the same moment there came a sound resembling the quick opening and as rapid closing of a door overhead, while a faint gleam of light flashed suddenly through the gloom and as suddenly faded away. I saw clearly the doom which had been prepared for me, and congratulated myself upon the timely accident by which I had escaped. Another step before my fall, and the world had seen me no more, and the death just avoided was of that very character which I have regarded as fabulous and frivolous in the tales respecting the Inquisition. To the victims of its tyranny, there was the choice of death with its direst physical agonies, or death with its most hideous moral horrors. I had been reserved for the latter, by long suffering my nerves had been unstrung until I trembled at the sound of my own voice, and had become in every respect a fitting subject of the species of torture which awaited me. Shaking in every limb, I groped my way back to the wall, resolving there to perish rather than risk the terrors of the well, of which my imagination now pictured many in various positions about the dungeon. In other conditions of mind, I might have had courage to end my misery at once by a plunge into one of these abysses, but now I was the veriest of cowards. Neither could I forget that I had read of these pits, that the sudden extinction of life formed no part of their most horrible plan. Agitation of spirit kept me awake for many long hours, but at length I again slumbered. Upon arousal, I found by my side, as before, a loaf and a pitcher of water. A burning thirst consumed me, and I emptied the vessel at a draught. It must have been drugged, for scarcely had I drunk before I became irresistibly drowsy. A deep sleep fell upon me, a sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, of course, I know not. But when, once again, I unclosed my eyes... The objects around me were visible. By a wild sulphurous luster, the origin of which I could not at first determine, I was enabled to see the extent and aspect of the prison. In its size, I had been greatly mistaken. The whole circuit of its walls did not extend twenty-five yards. For some minutes this fact occasioned me a world of vain trouble. Vain, indeed, for what could be of less importance, under the terrible circumstances which environed me, than these mere dimensions of my dungeon? But my soul took a wild interest in trifles, and I busied myself in endeavours to account for the error I had committed in my measurement. The truth at length flashed upon me. In my first attempt at exploration, I had counted fifty-two paces, up to the period when I fell. I must have then been within a pace or two of the fragment of surge. In fact, I had nearly performed the circuit of the vault. I then slept, and upon waking, I must have returned upon my steps, thus supposing the circuit nearly double what it actually was. 
My confusion of mind prevented me from observing that I began my tour with the wall to the left and ended it with the wall to the right. I had been deceived, too, in respect to the shape of the enclosure, and feeling my way I had found many angles, and thus deduced an idea of great irregularity, so potent is the effect of total darkness upon one arousing from lethargy or sleep. These angles were simply those of a few slight depressions, or niches, at odd intervals. The general shape of the prison was square. What I had taken for masonry seemed now to be iron, or some other metal, and huge plates, whose sutures or joints occasioned the depression. The entire surface of this metallic enclosure was rudely daubed in all the hideous and repulsive devices to which the carnal superstition of the monks has given rise. The figures of fiends and aspects of menace, with skeleton forms, and other more really fearful images, overspread and disfigured the walls. I observed that the outlines of these monstrosities were sufficiently distinct, but that the colours seemed faded and blurred, as if from the effects of a damp atmosphere. I now noticed the floor, too, which was of stone, in the centre yawned the circular pit from whose jaws I had escaped, but it was the only one in the dungeon. All this I saw indistinctly and by much effort, for my personal condition had been greatly changed during slumber. I now lay upon my back, and at full length, in a species of low framework of wood. To this I was securely bound by a long strap resembling a surcingle. It passed in many convolutions about my limbs and body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm to such extent that I could, by dint of much exertion, supply myself with food from an earthen dish which lay by my side on the floor. I saw to my horror that the pitcher had been removed. I say to my horror, for I was consumed with intolerable thirst. This thirst it appeared to be the design of my persecutors to stimulate, for the food in the dish was meat pungently seasoned. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some thirty or forty feet overhead, and constructed much as the side walls. In one of its panels, a very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was the painted figure of time as he is commonly represented, save that, in lieu of a scythe, he held what, at a casual glance, I supposed to be the picture of a huge pendulum, such as we see on antique clocks. There was something, however, in the appearance of this machine which caused me to regard it more attentively, while I gazed directly upward at it, for its position was immediately over my own. I fancied that I saw it in motion. In an instant afterward the fancy was confirmed. Its sweep was brief, and of course slow. I watched it for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder. Wearied at length with observing its dull movement, I turned my eyes upon the other objects in the cell. A slight noise attracted my notice, and looking to the floor I saw several enormous rats traversing it. They had issued from the well which lay just within view to my right. Even then, while I gazed, they came up in troops, hurriedly, with ravenous eyes, allured by the scent of the meat. From this it required much effort and attention to scare them away. It might have been half an hour, perhaps even an hour, for I could take but imperfect note of time. Before I again cast my eyes upward, what I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in extent by nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its velocity was also much greater, but what mainly disturbed me was the idea that it had perceptibly descended. I now observed, with what horror it is needless to say, that its nether extremity was formed of a crescent of glittering steel, about a foot in length from horn to horn, the horns upward and the under edge evidently as keen as that of a razor. Like a razor also, it seemed massy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid, broad structure above. It was appended to a weighty rod of brass, and the whole hissed as it swung through the air. I could no longer doubt the doom prepared for me by monkish ingenuity and torture. My cognizance of the pit had become known to the inquisitorial agents, the pit whose horrors had been destined for so bold a recusant as myself, the pit, typical of hell and regarded by rumour as the ultima thule of all their punishments. The plunge into this pit I had avoided by the merest of accidents. I knew that surprise or entrapment into torment formed an important portion of all the grotesqueries of these dungeon deaths. Having failed to fall, it was no part of the demon plan to hurl me into the abyss, and thus, there being no alternative, a different and a milder destruction awaited me. Milder! I half smiled in my agony as I thought of such application of such a term. What boots it to tell of the long, long hours of horror more than mortal during which I counted the rushing vibrations of the steel, inch by inch, line by line, with a descent only appreciable at intervals that seemed ages, down and still down it came days passed. It might have been that many days passed, ere it swept so closely over me as to fan me with its acrid breath. 
The odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. I prayed. I wearied heaven with my prayer for its most speedy descent. I grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself upward against the sweep of the fearful scimitar. And then I fell suddenly calm and lay smiling at the glittering death as a child at some rare bauble. Thank you for listening. This has been Edgar Allan Poe's The Pit in the Pendulum, part two. I've been Jay. This has been a web of classic tales. Please like, subscribe, and share. Click the bell icon for notifications. I hope you're having a fantastic day. Have a nice life, and I'll see you next time.